verses 1, 2, and 4. So three times through today, Mary. Verses 1, 2, and 4 on page 429. <laughs>
Father, we come to you again in thanks for all the blessings you have given to us. And we'd ask that you be with those who were here mentioned here this morning and give them the healing and the comfort and the strength that they need. Be with Mark as he brings to the, the message this morning and be with those who are traveling and be with the leaders of our, our nation and, and our world and help them to make decisions that are pleasing unto you and trust them we pray. Amen. All right, and our last song before the preacher comes is 10,000 Angel Angels. I did that last time. I think it's Nate Hargis up here. It just, I hung out with him too much. It is his fault. 10,000 Angels in the front of your hymnal. Thank <laughs> you. 
You two girls stand right here. Go. <laughs> Let's just do Jesus loves me. We know that one, don't we? Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to Him belong. They are weak, but He is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Such good sports. Let me give you a And now I'm going to go to class. One, two. Hazel was looking around the crowd thinking, uh oh, this is scary. It's just going to be me today. Well, it's just me now, so I'm scared too. Good morning, church. It's good to see you all here. Thank you for choosing uh, to come this morning and course up with us. <coughs> I want to just tell you a story today, and we'll see how that turns in uh, to uh, the rest uh, of the message. Uh, we've been going through uh, the life uh, of the man of God, uh, the life of Elijah, for the last uh, whole lot of weeks. Uh, and uh, now uh, we're getting to a transition where I have just a couple weeks left. Uh, but I didn't want to leave out this story because uh, I think it's not just interesting, but also says a lot to the world uh, that we live in. Uh, let me introduce the characters to the story. Uh, of course, there is Elijah, the man of God, the prophet of God. Uh, he doesn't show up until near the end of the story. Uh, but let's introduce the others that we've talked about up to this point. Uh, taking a very prominent role uh, is Queen Jezebel, uh, the evil queen uh, of the country of Israel. Uh, she came and married King Ahab, we'll talk about him in a moment, uh, and from a different country. So she brought with her uh, all of her false gods and the demon worship uh, and it introduced them into uh, the land of Israel, uh, who used to honor God, but with her different policies uh, and her different uh, worship practices, uh, began to lead the nation, well, that she didn't begin, but further took them down that road uh, of apostasy, uh, turning away from God. And we have King Ahab. Uh, Ahab was the fifth in the generation uh, of the kings of Israel. Uh, Ahab was uh, one who, uh, after the nation of Israel split into two, the kingdom of Israel to the north, the kingdom of Judah to the south, uh, Ahab was in that line with Jeroboam, who, was stand, who had their uh, nation up there in Samaria. Uh, and it says of Ahab several times in Scripture that he was the most evil king uh, of Israel. Uh, just so you know the setup with that. So we have Ahab, we have Jezebel, we have Elijah, and then we have a man named Naboth. Naboth, he basically is the bystander, uh, the good guy of the story. Uh, you know, every story that has a different, that differentiates between uh, the good guy and the bad guys, usually there's a twist in it, right? You get to hear both sides of the story, so you get to judge which one is right, just like a good Judge Judy case. Uh, you have a chance to kind of decide uh, how things are unfolding before you. As we get to the story, I also want to remind you that although this is a biblical story, uh, it is also a story, not a biblical story about people that happened a long time ago in history. It also is a story uh, about life uh, because our the Bible doesn't just tell us what did happen a long time ago, but it tells us what does happen even in our lives today. And we know or notice time and again in Scripture that people and their roles throughout Scripture, uh, the Bible that we have are influenced by spiritual uh, beings. Just like we believe in God, who is spirit, there also is the devil and his demons who work against God. Uh, as God tries to do ministry, there is schemes put out there to do anti-ministry. And we know, even from our own life, 
that the truth of life is that it is spiritual. You can look at people and understand what they do, uh, but you won't fully understand the gist of their situation until you understand their spiritual side uh, that is influencing their life. And so, as we begin this story, note that people are influenced by spirits, and in this case, by the demonic with King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. In fact, you know, we're going to start in an odd place today. We're going to start uh, the story in the book of Revelation because we have uh, talked up to this point about what Je Jezebel stood for and about how evil that she was and about the way that she led people away. In fact, it's interesting. It's not just Jezebel the person, but the spirit that's in Jezebel, the demonic forces that make a difference in this. Uh, the spirit of Jezebel, the spirit that's in Jezebel, known for its sexual sins, known for its no boundaries, surrounded herself uh, by eunuchs uh, and we find her in every situation standing up against authority. In fact though we also find here even in the book of Revelation the reference that is made to her thousands of years after she lived and died we find her in the church uh, as a religious person taking the beliefs and behaviors that were forbidden in life and making them tolerated celebrating the things that God condemns. Revelation chapter 2, uh, in the writings uh, of the Apostle uh, John, uh, as he recounts the letters that Jesus writes to the church, to the church at Thyatira, Revelation chapter 2, uh, and verses uh, 20 and following, says this to the church in Thyatira. Nevertheless, Jesus says, I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, by her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and then eating the food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling, so I will cast her on a bed of suffering and will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. Now, we know that Jezebel wasn't alive at this point, but Jesus is making reference to the spiritual forces, the same ones that influenced Jezebel way back then, was there within the church even to this day. I say all that because it helps us find a relation to our lives uh, as children of God and where we are. Along with the spirit of Jezebel, the spirit in Jezebel. There's the spirit of Ahab, the spirit that's in him. It's a spirit that's passive, a spirit that's tolerant. Uh, he's just a spoiled, selfish brat. So here's how the story goes. Let's read, if you have your Bibles, uh, the book of 1 Kings, uh, chapter 21. And, and let's just read the first few verses together, uh, and then uh, we'll continue on with the story from there. 1 Kings, chapter 21, uh, the story of Naboth's vineyard. Sometime later, there was an incident involving a vineyard belonging to Naboth, the Jezreelite. The vineyard was in Jezreel, close to the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. Ahab said to Naboth, Let me have your vineyard to use for a vegetable garden. Since it is close to my palace, in exchange I will give you a better vineyard, or if you prefer, I will pay you whatever it's worth. But Naboth replied, the Lord forbid that I give you the inheritance of my father. So Ahab went home, sullen and angry, because Naboth the Jezreelite had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my father's. Ahab lay on his bed, sulking, and refused to eat. His wife Jezebel came in and asked him, Why are you so sullen? Why won't you eat? And he answered her, Because I said to Naboth the Jezreelite, Sell me your vineyard, or if you prefer, I will give you another vineyard in his place. But he said, I will not give you my vineyard. Jezebel, his wife, said, Is this how you act as king over Israel? Get up and eat. Cheer up. I'll get you the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. So we have this instance with this story uh, about a vineyard. And it just happens that the vineyard is next to the king's palace. And the king sees the vineyard and he thinks, You know what would be really nice in that vineyard? If I tore it all down and made a vegetable garden out of it. <laughs> and so he goes to the guy and proposes a deal. Why don't you sell me the vineyard and I will pay you what it's worth or I'll give you another one. Because he honestly had a, quite a bit of land that he didn't necessarily need the one that he was looking at for his uh, potatoes and tomatoes. Uh, but he goes and then Naboth and asks him to make a deal for the vineyard. Naboth says, I can't give you the vineyard. It's been in my family for years. This land is important to me. It would be wrong for me to sell you this vineyard. 
So King Ahab gets his heart broken, and he goes back to the palace, and we have this weird scene in the story where the king lays on his bed and pouts. <laughs> he throws a little fit because he doesn't get his way, or he throws a fit because he knows who's about ready to come in the door. We've been in those situations, right? <laughs> the best time to throw the fit is when somebody is going to do something about it is about ready to walk in and see you throwing the fit. And sure enough, that's what happens. He's all upset because he doesn't get a vineyard. He's refusing to eat. His life has fallen apart because he can't plant his row of green beans uh, right where he wants to put them. And the queen comes in. Jezebel. There's evilness in the queen, even beyond, possibly, what was in King Ahab. And he, she, she looks at his pathetic situation and says, what is it that you are so worried about? Why are you crying so much uh, about this vineyard? Uh, what is the big deal? And Ahab tells the story, I want it and I just can't have it. And I just want it. And you can only picture what it may have been like for him to throw this little hissy fit in front of his wife. She says, this is not what a king should do. You look kind of dumb. Not necessarily in those words. But then she says, you want the vineyard, I'll get you the vineyard. And the rest of the story goes like this. Queen Jezebel gets some letters written. Uh, and she uh, writes these letters, signs Ahab's name to him, puts Ahab's seal upon these letters to make them an official document, and sends them to the elders uh, of the city where Naboth is. And all in that letter, what she says is, let's have a big feast, or let's get ready for a day of fasting, she uses that term, uh, possibly making a connection to a religious uh, experience that she wanted the people to have, where they would all come together for a time and all be sitting in the same room where they could talk about things that were unrelated to the vineyard, but that the people in the community would all be gathered in the same place at a time. And then she told the officials, get a couple of worthless men, a couple villains, and pose them there at the, the place where everyone will be and have them make this up about Naboth. Tell the people who are there at the place that Naboth has cursed God and Naboth has curse the king so that they will punish him by taking him out and killing him. She wraps up the letter and sends him off, and sure enough, just as her letter uh, <laughs> proposes uh, gets it accomplished in that way, the people of the community come together for a fast. Naboth is there, not having a clue of what was going on. And, and in a moment, it seems, that one person stands up and says, this man is bad. He has cursed God and cursed the king. And another man stands up, two witnesses were important in the Old Testament community, and says, yes, I saw him do the very same thing. And in a moment, as the story goes along, they take Naboth out and stone him to death right where he is. Then Jezebel after hearing what happened, goes back to King Ahab. Maybe he is still in his sullen mess. Uh, they're crying uh, on his bed. I don't know how long this must have taken or how pathetic his uh, spirit may have been. But she basically opens the door, rushes into the room and says, you want your vineyard? Go take your vineyard. Naboth is gone. Ahab then uh, takes possession of the vineyard, believing that he has got away with it. And as the story progresses, uh, as evil seems to have its day, uh, as the bad guys seem to be able to get whatever they want, the man of God comes in. Uh, and uh, he has a chance to, once again, confront Ahab for the sins that he has done. Uh, and it gets pretty brutal, it gets pretty black, it gets pretty dark about what God says is going to happen uh, to Ahab. Ahab realizes his, the condemnation that is put upon his life and the generations of those who are following after him from what God has given uh, his stance with justice there. And so he begins to kind of uh, feel sorry and act as if he repents. And God says, okay, I will give you a little bit of time, but these things are still going to happen to your family and you will not continue, you and your family will not continue reigning uh, as kings uh, here in, in this country. The story of Naboth, Jezebel, Ahab, 
and Elijah. Basically, you could tell a story with just a few phrases. Ahab wants, uh, Ahab whines, Jezebel ignites, Jezebel deceives, and Elijah shows uh, up. Let's take a few moments and look at the way that this uh, unfolds. The very first thing, Abraham, Ahab, excuse me, way too many names running around in my mind this morning. Ahab wants the vineyard. You can say it in different words, the words that we don't use very often uh, in today's world. Ahab covets the vineyard. Ahab sees something that his neighbor has and says, that should be mine. Uh, and it's silly to think that the king of uh, the nation of Israel at this point would need that particular vineyard. How much other land and how much other vineyards and how much other space could he have had? But yet what we see here is Ahab is entitled. And he feels like he needs not just more land, but that particular land. Uh, so here we have, at the beginning of the story, a government official who steals the land, right? And throws a big fit uh, about what's going on. And, and through this story, you have to ask yourself, well, who's the good guy in this, in this disagreement? Who is just in, in this scenario? And it's interesting, someone pointed out this way. He says, injustice begins when you feed coveting over contentment. The big problem that Ahab had in his life other than that he didn't worship the Lord, is that he was consumed uh, by this uh, demonic spirit, uh, this entitled spirit, this passive spirit, believing this selfish spirit who believed that he could have whatever he wanted, and it was his right to get it because he was the king. And justice begins when you feed coveting over contentment. Ahab has much, but he has a lust for more. And it's at that moment that we have the good guy, or at least the bystander. We know that not every, everyone is not good. Everyone has their own problems in life. But all we have that we know about Naboth is that he owned a vineyard uh, and that he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, basically, he stands up for himself in a moment. He says, I can't sell you the vineyard. It would be wrong for me to sell you that vineyard. And then Ahab goes back to where he whines. We know it. Sulking is manipulation. Right? Uh, the way that Ahab was used to getting his way was probably directly connected to what this story reintroduces him with. We learn from an early age if we throw the right fit at the right time in front of the right people, we can sure get what we want. And, and again, the picture must have been pathetic. Uh, here's a man with a crown on his head uh, with the uh, uh, and owning uh, so much uh, that's a part of this uh, country, uh, this nation, uh, being able to do whatever he wants. But here is this man in this moment crying, whining on his bed because Ahab was a victim. And, and victims need someone who will save them. And every victim needs a practical savior, and, and they rely on someone else who will come and fix up the messes. You know people like that. Oh, there's something going wrong in my life. I can't do anything. Uh, I will just sit here and get myself in a little ball and rock back and forth and wait for someone to come and fix my problems because there's nothing that I can do uh, to fix them at all. And that's where Ahab was uh, because he had learned that that's how he gets what he wants. Do we have people in our world like that today? Oh, do we? Oh, do we? Those who feel entitled, who feel that everyone has to go out of their way uh, to take care of them. Those who have to bend over backwards just so that these selfish people can get the things that they want. So Ahab obviously follows whoever shows up to do his work. Which reminds us how easy it is to deceive a person like Ahab. All they want are their selfish needs taken care of. And anyone can manipulate them when they go to help solve the problems that they're in. Let's go back to the story. How do we resolve this difference of opinion? Ahab wanted the vineyard. Naboth wasn't going to sell him the vineyard. Uh, how did things get resolved? Who was right in the story, as you've already drawn some of the conclusions there? The next part of the story is that Jezebel enters the room. And Jezebel ignites 
the situation. Jezebel is, is a queen who will take action. Uh, Jezebel schemes. She comes up with these falsifying letters, uh, uh, messing with government documents, uh, and calling on elders to set up this uh, situation, uh, possibly even for worship. Uh, Jezebel knows her way in the realm of the religious people and the people that she was serving. She knew how to get things done and was not going to let anything get in her way of getting this done. It's interesting you know, the, the way that the scripture uses this word, the people that she had to help them out, uh, is they had villains. They were, they were worthless men, people who were just bent on doing whatever, whoever paid them enough uh, that they were to do. And that was who she used uh, to finish uh, this uh, story. So Jezebel deceives. She takes the truth and twists it. In our battle of good and evil, in our understanding of life, uh, we understand that the world is spiritual. We also know that God creates and that Satan counterfeits, uh, that God provides and that Satan uh, twists and, and perverts. Good becomes evil and evil begets described as good. Here justice is changed. Maybe you've seen that going on in the world around you, how justice doesn't seem very just anymore. But it's more a matter of popular opinion or those people who have more influence that are able to change the laws and change the ways uh, to fit themselves. Uh, and maybe when you consider where we are as a nation, as a melting pot of so many different cultures, there's lots of people to make happy, lots of people to influence. And, and so, honestly, it sounds good that we create a system of justice to try to help the most people out. But the problem is the same that happened in this story. They had turned their back on God's justice, on sovereign justice, on understanding what truly is right based upon the biblical principles that God has laid down in his word. And so we have this more liberal justice, a social justice that's fluid in its directives that it gives. Social justice becomes what people, what sinners decide is right and wrong instead of God's sovereign justice that tells us what's right and wrong. You have seen that in your world, the way that things have changed, even in your lifetime. Those things that used to be wrong have now been watered down and accepted. Well, let's use the word that Jesus used in Revelation. Things have been tolerated to allow them to be accepted. It was John Wesley who said, what one generation tolerates, the next embraces. Is there any wonder in our world today that our justice system looks like it does? We have gotten away from biblical principles and allowed someone else and some other influences to come in and change the way that we think about what is right and about what is wrong. All the way from marriage to abortion to welfare. Who gets to determine what is just and what is unjust? In this story, it was the government. It was the king and queen and the spiritual forces behind them. In other situations, it's the mob. Whoever votes the most uh, is what, able uh, to get whatever they want done. Or does justice matter come down to what God wants? It doesn't seem that that's true anymore. And the conflict that you know is out in the open. You have to choose your sides. You, you can't ignore it anymore. We're headed to a place in our country where evilness seems to have its day. And the story that we hear uh, from Scripture that happened thousands of years ago about how an evil queen uh, takes this guy's land and has him killed uh, just to satisfy uh, the craving, the, the lust uh, of her husband doesn't seem to be that weird of a story anymore in the lives of the people uh, of, of our lives uh, today. Tolerance is everywhere. Are people going to stand up against injustice or justice that's not based upon God's sense, God's sovereignty of justice? The result is that lots of things are declared just, and they just aren't. There's lots of things that get rationalized as right that are simply wrong. You see it in the ways of sexuality. You see it in the ways of giving money. It invades even your ideology. How do you know right and wrong if you don't know God? I think it's interesting in that part of the story when 
everything else is accomplished, then God shows up. Then God gives uh, Elijah a phone call and says, Hey, Elijah, I need you to get involved. I need you to go to tell them uh, what my word is. Uh, I need you to go and lay down the law and give a directive to what King Ahab is doing all over again. Because Ahab doesn't think that there's anything wrong. In fact, it's interesting in the way that the story is written and the way that it unfolds. Queen Jezebel comes in and says, your problem solved. You can have the vineyard. Ahab never asks, well, what happened to Naboth? He doesn't care. He's only out for what he wants. And he goes and takes possession of the vineyard uh, that that she provided for him. Jezebel is the controlling factor in the story. And in fact, you could probably conclude uh, in the way that we have discovered uh, this story of her, of the relationship between her and Elijah, that she is the controlling factor in mo much of these uh, lessons that we've talked about. The demonic influences that have been a part of her life uh, continue uh, to create stress and difficulty for everyone there in the nation. There are a few keys to know about the spirit of Jezebel, the spirit that was in Jezebel, the spirit who twists and perverts and follows what the enemy has to say. You see, in this story, uh, Jezebel never loses. Uh, and Jezebel's spirit will never lose. Uh, if they get to a situation where they have problems, they're just going to create a new war. Uh, it was a battle on Mount Carmel uh, just a little bit before, a few weeks ago, that we talked about, uh, where uh, the uh, pagan gods uh, were shown to be false, uh, and all of the false prophets were killed. But that didn't stop Jezebel. You don't ever tell Jezebel no. Ahab comes in, sawing, sulking. Oh, we couldn't get the land. I really wanted it, and I wish I had it. And very resolutely, Jezebel says, Oh, yes, we will. Oh, yes, we will get what you want. Jezebel hates authority. She is fiercely independent. Ahab has no idea what his wife is doing. Uh, Jezebel doesn't care about the truth or the law. In fact, she weaponizes the law to get her way. She will do whatever she can uh, to get victory. And there's always strings attached with Jezebel. She had people doing her bidding. Uh, the officers who were there in the community, the two worthless villains who stood up and were false witnesses with that. And you have to remind yourself, even in those situations, who owns you? Who owns the situation that you're in? Getting you to make the decisions to, to pervert the justice in ways that are there. There's so much that goes on behind the scenes that people just are not aware of as evil continues to manipulate uh, other people. And, as a last note, Jezebel was religious. She even weaponizes the word of God. She knew in order to convict someone to death, you had to have two witnesses. She had it set up uh, and, and had a feast or had a fast declared, uh, an opportunity for everybody to be together just to be able to witness uh, Naboth's uh, <laughs> false accusations that would send him to his death. The spirit of Jezebel is wicked. The spirit of Ahab and his passivity is also wicked. The spirit of Ahab is soft and lazy. Soft men allow evil and to rule and reign in the world around them. Soft men are people pleasers. Instead of standing up for what's true and what God calls them to do, notice how Jezebel uh, manipulates Ahab with flattery. Uh, and she comes in and says, oh, you're a great king. You deserve that land. We'll make sure that we get that for you. And Ahab is taken. All it takes is a little bit of false love uh, in order to get his attention. Ahab is not generous. In every story we have of him, he's a taker, never a giver. Ahab is selfish. Uh, the only time that he has compassion is for himself. And, and so we have these two different, King Ahab and Queen Jezebel, and how do these two people get along? Because they benefit one another. This is your typical codependent relationship. Uh, the passive person who wants someone else to save them, and the aggressive person who will do whatever they can to have the power uh, that they need. Why don't we see these demonic influences in our culture today? Maybe we do. Maybe we don't use the same terms to call them what they are. But deception calls much of what happens to today justice. You know, the headline of the paper that day, 
thousands of years ago. Uh, the headline of the newspaper was one that probably declared justice. It probably said something that Naboth cursed God and cursed the king, and it was he was dealt with for his crimes. The religious leaders and judicial leaders did a full examination, complete with witnesses, so a bad man was put to death. That's probably how it was spun. That's probably how it was related to the world around them. What sinners call justice can really be unjust to God. If you still have your Bibles open, uh, let's go back to the story uh, and read verse 17. Uh, when God summons uh, Elijah uh, to show up, 1 Kings chapter 21, verse 17, very simply says, The word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite. Never underestimate those simple phrases. The word of the Lord. When the word of the Lord gets involved, there's truth. When the, when the, Lord, the word of the Lord gets involved, uh, there is foundation. When the word of the Lord gets involved, uh, there is not just a sense of right and wrong. There is a directive coming from the sovereign one. God says, go down to me, verse 18. Ahab, king of Israel, who rules in Samaria. He's now in Naboth's vineyard, where he has gone to take possession of it. Say to him, uh, this is what the Lord says. Have you not murdered man and seized his property? Then say to him, this is what the Lord says. In the place where dogs licked, licked up Naboth's blood, dogs will lick up your blood. Yes, even yours. Oh, what a bearer of great news. Hey, Elijah, go down and meet Ahab in the field that he just took of the murdered man and call him out. Say, hey, God knows what you did. And in the same dogs that licked up the guy's blood that you had killed, that's how you're going to die. And it gets dark. It gets black. In fact, uh, the, next word, the, the next verse here uh, I also find interesting because it shows us a little bit about Ahab again. Ahab said to Elijah, So you have found me, my enemy. He knew what was coming. He knew that Elijah was going to show up in the middle of all of this sin. Ahab knew that God was going to send Elijah to bring a confrontation to his life. And maybe that's what we are too. We think we're getting away from sin, but we know deep down, we know deep down that God's going to show up, that God's going to have someone say, hey, time to pay the piper. You think you've gotten away with it? You really haven't. He goes on to tell him uh, what's going to happen from him, and that not just Ahab, but all of his sons will die, and that Jezebel uh, will be eaten by dogs, and that dogs uh, will eat those who belong to Ahab, and birds in the air will feed on those who die in the country. Uh, and it, it, just a real bad thing uh, for God to come down and tell you uh, about what's going to happen uh, to your family. Verse 27 is also, uh, as the story continues, uh, where it gets a little bit interesting. It says this, when Ahab heard these words, he tore his clothes, put on a sackcloth, and fasted. He lay in sackcloth and went around meekly. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Have you noticed how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself, I will not bring this disaster to his day, but I will bring it on the house in the days of his son. I think it's interesting, one of the study notes that I mentioned, or in preparation for this, mentioned uh, we hear this story about uh, how God sees Ahab react. Ahab knows he's just in the wrong. Oh, Ahab knows that he has pushed God too far, and God's condemnation on his life has hit a nerve with him again. It's Ahab. He's got a lot of nerves. Oh, he's always the victim. He's always worried about someone triggering him, uh, if that's the right words uh, that we use in our culture today. And so he gets triggered, and he goes off, and he tries to humble himself before God. And this is what uh, one particular uh, writer says. He says, you know, in that situation, we think that God is showing his mercy to Ahab. And possibly he is. Ahab humbles himself. God knows his heart. We don't know his heart. Ahab is a mess of a person. He is easily manipulated by whatever situation is happening around him. But he also took me to the passage from Romans that tells us about God's wrath and how God is patient in letting us live here on this earth because as we live against his words, we are only storing up more wrath for ourselves. We get a story about this justice 
uh, and injustice. If you have your Bibles, let's read that in Romans. Uh, Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2, verses 3 and following says this. So when you, a mere man, pass judgment on them, yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of His kindness, tolerance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you towards repentance? But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, when His righteous judgment will be revealed. God will give to each person according to what he has done. And what the teacher was trying to say is, sometimes when these unjust things happen, we get really frustrated, right? How can something bad happen to this good guy? Why does it always think, seem that the bad guys are able to get away with all of the sin, destruction, and the manipulation that they have on people? Why doesn't God do anything about it? Romans says, don't worry. God knows what's going on. And God's keeping track. And he will give to each person according to what they have done. And so that maybe by prolonging Ahab's life, he was just letting them cook his goose even further. He knew that evilness was not going to stop in his heart. And he was going to be able to store up even more wrath uh, against God for when his judgment happens uh, in eternity. What is just? What is right? The basic of the story is it comes down uh, to what God's word says. But it also reminds me of a story that happens in the New Testament. There was another man condemned to die with false witnesses. And that was the man Jesus. If you remember during his trial, there were people who stood up and said, Oh yeah, you should have heard what he said. And they brought one false witness after him against another. And it was based upon those witnesses that he was taken outside of the city and killed. Jesus doesn't say that he owned a vineyard, but he called himself the vine. <laughs> he called himself uh, the one that you have to be connected to, uh, to know God. And what happened on that cross that day that Jesus died was, in some sense, sovereign justice. Not that Jesus got what he deserved, but Jesus got what we deserve. That in that moment there on the cross, all of the sins of people uh, up to that point and continuing on from that point until he comes back, Jesus paid the, the penalty. He paid the wrath of God that people are storing up against God for that day of eternity. We read the story of Ahab and Jezebel and we think, boy, they're evil. I know people. And we want to put lists down and we get frustrated why they get away with things. God knows people too. And he tells us, don't worry about it. Because you're one of those people. Just as their sin puts them in harm's way with the wrath of God, so does your sin. But we worship Jesus today because on that cross, thousands of years ago, when Jesus died to pay the penalty for our sins, he removed that guilt from our life so that when we stand before God, all of the list of sins that we have done in our life are no longer there. They've been erased and covered by the blood of Christ. The story of Naboth, in some ways, is a story of Jesus. We want justice. We want things to be right. But we really don't. We want Jesus, and we want his forgiveness to be a part of our sins. We come to a time in our service to say, what do we need to do to honor Jesus? Uh, what steps do we need to take uh, to love Jesus? And, and quite simply, uh, he continues to call upon our life, believe in him, put our faith in him, be baptized in him, surrender your life to him, let Jesus have control of your life. Uh, and that means all of your worries. That means all of your anger at other people's injustices. Don't worry. God's got it covered. God knows what's going on. He knows not only what they have done, but he knows what you have done unless you repent of your sins, unless you humble yourself and let Jesus' blood cover you so that you can be sinless in the eyes of the Lord. If we need to help you in the decisions that you need to make today, we're going to go to our hymn of decision. 
We're going to sing a song, number 330, Are You Washed in the Blood of the Lamb? And it does matter. It does matter where you stand uh, with the sacrifice that Jesus has made for you. Uh, it does matter because just as we don't know what goes on in people's hearts, we don't know what really happened with Jezebel and Ahab until it, it is given to us through the Spirit of God by what is written in Scripture. We don't know what goes on in other people's lives as they can seem to do wrong against us, but God does. And God knows your heart. You need to surrender to follow Him. Let's stand and sing our first verse. Uh, if you need to respond, come forward today. Are you washed in the blood? Number 330.